Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna call the Marion Township Board of Supervisors meeting for November 19th, 2020 to order. The time is now 7.02 p.m. We are doing these meetings still through telepresence on account of coronavirus and Governor Wolf's stay at home orders. Uh, normally we do the Pledge of Allegiance. However, with it being telepresence, we are going to omit that. First order of business is to approve the minutes of the October 29th, 2020 Board of Supervisors meeting. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. Next order of business is to approve the minutes of the November 14th workshop meeting. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay, next is to approve the payment of the bills for November 2020. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Roll call, Peter. Irene? Aye. Jim? Aye. Okay. At this time, we'll open up the floor to public comments. Sue, did we receive any through uh, email or phone call? There were no emails and no phone calls. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I don't see anybody waving their hands or anything in terms of public comments. So we'll move on to the items for discussion. Uh, for anybody that is on the meeting, the link is in the chat for the public directory, which contains any of the, the meeting minutes, uh, agendas for the public, financial reports, and a draft copy of the budget. Um, so if you're interested in following along beyond what we're talking about, and we'll be sharing out on the screen for certain uh, portions of the agenda, everything is there uh, directly for your review and inspection. Um, first item on the discussion is the emergency declaration. This was uh, made back in uh, April. We opted to extend this until such a time as the board saw that the, the clear and present danger of coronavirus had cleared. Uh, I suggest that we continue as we have in prior months to leave it in place. Um, and uh, worth noting, the August 31st declaration from Governor Wolf extended the emergency order another 90 days from that date, which uh, is what allows us to perform these meetings through telepresence. Um, based on what's happening with coronavirus, I fully anticipate uh, an extension of that again, as the, the trend is continuing upwards in cases rather than downwards. Um, so as a side note to that, I hope everybody is staying safe, staying healthy, practicing social distancing, washing your hands, and uh, doing everything you can to stay out of harm's way. Um, Jim and Irene, do you have anything that you want to touch on with this before we move on to the next item? Or No, I just would like everyone to stay safe. Okay. <laughs> Next up on the agenda is the Eagle Disposal Bins. Uh, we have been offered recycling and trash totes free of charge. Uh, this will enable Eagle to use the uh, arms on the truck to pick up the trash and the recycling. Uh, however, when their contract expires, we do uh, run the risk of them not being a thing. So if we opt not to renew with Eagle or end up going to a different company where that's not a component in the plan, um, we would have a situation where we would no longer have those provided totes. Uh, we talked a little bit about this on the, the Saturday meeting. My concern is the, the barrier for exit on that, that if we tell everybody to, to get rid of their trash cans and start using these and contract renewal time comes and it's prohibitively expensive to continue it, we would then have to tell everybody to go out and get trash cans again. Um, Sue, so refresh me. Was it Andrew, Casey, from, from yes. Eagle? Okay. Yes. So seeing as I see Andrew on, I'm actually going to uh, – actually, it looks like he's already unmuted um, – uh, Andrew, hello, good evening. How you doing? Doing well. So uh, I know you had wanted to, to be present and uh, be part of the discussion here. Um, I know the last time we had bid out for that, the reason we didn't inherently have the, the totes in the contract was because of the substantial price difference between totes and no totes. Yes. We, believe me, we recognize the, the utility of them. There's a certain benefit to having a standardized thing, both from aesthetics and from efficiency for you guys. But the concern that we all kind of echo is 
we're about a year and a half ish through the contract. We have a, a total lifespan of that contract of about five, three and a half ish years will come and go before we know it. So we're, we're hesitant to tell everybody to get rid of their receptacles that they have switch over to this only to, to have a very real possibility where we would not have that as an offered service in the future. I see. Well, I mean, if you were used the carts and you did like them, say you had them, and then when the contract went out to bid, I would be more competitive while my bid, my price would be down as opposed to other people bidding it to replace carts um, because I already had the capital out there. Um, you know, it's something I'm providing for you. Whereas if it was in the contract, like you said, it would be a substantial amount. So I, I see what you're saying. It's also, if you were with us for another three years, that's about the lifespan of a trash can that usually gets worn out. So you can look at it that way that you'd probably have to replace trash can within three years, a normal cheap one anyways. Okay, Irene, Jim? Mm -hmm. Can we get what you just said in writing that, about your competitive bid? So the, the concern that I have on that is even if you did put it in writing, there, there's not really, a, and believe me, Andrew, this is, this is nothing against you. This is just a broad statement. You're, no actual surety is being given on that, that you're not saying that there's going to be a price break of X number of dollars. So it's other than good faith, which is, is great, there's really, even in writing, not a lot of, of structural guarantee therein. That it could be yes, it'll be substantially cheaper, but what what does that actually really mean? What does that translate to it at the end of the day when we go to do a renegotiation for the contract? Yeah, I, and I, I can't tell what the market is. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't tell the next month what it would be for my price breakdown. So yeah, and that's and that's completely understandable. That's uh, a reality of, of doing business in a number of markets. Is it's especially right now fairly volatile. So uh, I. I don't think any of us hold that against you that you're not able or, or willing to offer that sort of commitment simply because it is three years from now. A lot of things can change in three years. Can I offer my thoughts? Absolutely. Um, I agree with Andrew that the average lifespan of a trash can is about three years. Uh, in fact, with some people, it's less than that, particularly me. Uh, <laughs> so I would agree with him that, you know, this makes sense to me to do this because we're getting some complaints. This is going to cut down on complaints because it's going to be much easier for them to pick up trash. Um, we have them here in the development at, Stone, at Stonecroft, and it's marvelous to see them come in, take that arm out, grab that can, dump it. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's going to be a lot quicker for them. It's going to be a lot easier for our residents. And quite frankly, I think he's right. If, uh, if for some reason in three years uh, he doesn't have the, the right bid for the contract, people would have to buy new cans by that time anyway. Okay. I, I see where you're coming from. And I either have a particularly nice trash can or I've been particularly gentle with mine. I've had mine for like eight years now. I know as soon as I say that, it'll probably break tomorrow. But <laughs> um, there is a certain finite lifespan on them. And I, I acknowledge that. The, the real question is the is the useful life three years? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? If it's three years, then yeah, absolutely. If we're going to be looking at replacing things anyway, it makes perfect sense. It starts to become less compelling the further you go out. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm truthfully, I'm kind of 50, 50. I really like the idea of the standardized trash cans, especially when it's at a no cost. But again, I, I'm hesitant because of that barrier for exit. Once you get used to a service, you don't want to walk away from it. And uh, uh, Jim, I don't know if you got a chance to look at the, the, the stuff that Sue had sent over and the, when the bid packets had gone out, like I said, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, that it was a, a marked difference in cost per month. Right. Andrew. And I would think it's going to be a marked difference in the future for, for it too, because the new people will have to provide cans where Andrew is offering us these cans for free. So I... I, my, my per, that's my personal opinion. Irene, or actually, Andy, you were going to say something before I query Irene. I was going to ask Andrew, um, would you guys deliver these these cans to to each uh, resident? Would they be completely assembled when you would deliver them? I mean, you wouldn't deliver them to the, to the township and have people come to pick them or have the township be responsible to deliver them, correct? 
No, uh, well, I mean, I would deliver them. I actually use a third party company that that's all they do is they're very fast and they go and they deliver them and they'll mark, they have a serial number on them. So they jot down the serial number to the house. So those cans are assigned to that house and they're fully assembled. They'd have a uh, brochure that I put in them. They tell us how the customers, how to use them and the benefits of them. And, you know, they'd be delivered right to the house. And so this it, is a trash can and a recycling can? Correct. It would be a 96-gallon um, toter for trash and then a 65-gallon um, toter for recycle, which it's a very big recycle um, container. So that would help with uh, your, your residents would probably recycle more. And then that would help you with your recycle money because your recycle numbers would probably go up because you can just fit more into them. And they're really stable on a windy day. They don't blow over and you don't have recycled blowing away on a windy day. And also like if you have customers to just set out just trash bags, you don't have pests and uh, pets getting into them. And it has, helps cut down on the litter in the town. And would your, would your third party contractor pick up the people's existing cans, if they wanted to get rid of them, would they take those? Yes, I could arrange for that, yes. So as a, as a quick question, as we're talking about trash, trash bags versus the cans, I know there is a, a line in the, the contract that it's a legacy thing about some of the, the senior citizens that have the, the bags with the tags at the reduced cost. How will that unfold for them? Would they also receive a can or how would that dynamic work? Uh, I can work that out however you want. If you want them to still stay on the cans because uh, stay on the bag system because I know it is cheaper for them, I, I, I'd be okay with that and I'd let everybody know we work that in. But if you want me to provide them with a can so that they had one, we could do that too. But usually with the senior citizens, that uh, if they have a bag program, they're probably going to want to stick with that. Oh yeah, no, I just meant mostly from like a billing aspect and for you guys, I think if we offered a senior citizen a, a tote, uh, a toter to uh, to put their stuff in rather than bags, they'd probably take it. I don't think it would be turned away. Peter, can I interject a minute? Yes, absolutely. My mother does the bag for seniors thing. Um, she actually puts those bags um, in a trash can. Uh, okay. so, the critter, so critters don't get in the bags. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. But I just was curious from a uh, mm -hmm. collection and, and billing standpoint, they are treated a little differently in that mm -hmm. respect in terms of, of, of volumes that are allowed and things like that. So I was, I was curious from Eagle standpoint, how the, the proposal sat to, to approach that specifically. Because like I said, well, I don't think anybody's going to shy away from a, a essentially free trash can. The, the problem is like, is, is that one on your scope for dealing with the fact that you now have uh, people that are paying a reduced rate for theoretically a smaller collection amount, that's why it's a reduced rate, um, using the same 96 gallon trash can. Yeah, I mean, I could look at the logistics of that, but I, I think I, I'd leave it up, if they wanted the can, we could put it there. Okay. Irene, what are your thoughts? Um, communication has been poor between Eagle and the community. I know there's been a lot of people calling us up at the office with complaints. Um, I've tried to get through myself and, and not had had much success. Um, I guess my question is, will you be able to send out a mailer for to the residents with respect to these changes? I'd like to be able to notify everyone and having a bin show up at my front door without me having any previous knowledge of it, I might ignore it, or you're gonna get a lot of phone calls if that happens. What I've been doing with other municipalities is that I do, do we've been putting it out on Facebook, and also then, like I said, this is about what it looks like, the flyer that they would be getting, that would be in the toter itself that explains it. And we have a large, portion of our population that doesn't even have a computer. So, you know, for, for, I would say, Sue, would you agree with me? A majority of our population, Facebook is useless. So, uh, yeah, from what I hear. Yeah. 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 So, 
Do you do any mass callings at all? Do you have a? No, we don't. We don't. We don't do any robo dialing. Yeah. Okay. It's Sue, and sometimes me in the office, and sometimes Peter, and sometimes Dan now. But you know, it, you know, I, I guess it, it's good, just going to be one of those other things. Like, okay, what now? What next? So we've had people that are calling because their trash isn't being picked up. We, you know, it's a change in service, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. The only thing, the only thing I could think of, Irene, is we're going to be sending out a, a couple of letters yeah. all in one packet. That we, if we're going to coordinate this for maybe like the start of the new year, if we're actually seriously entertaining this, that we could slip that into that that pamphlet of letters and make it one large mailing. If uh, Andrew's able to supply us with the the literature to put in the envelope, we could maybe piggyback that. That that would make sense to me because then everyone has notification of it. Um, what about those residents that don't want to have the tote? Now, if one of the totes gets damaged, um, disappears, et cetera, et cetera, again, you know, I understand there's some responsibility on the homeowner, but we've had high winds, we've had, you know, high water, et cetera. If it's through no fault of their own, how are they supposed to demonstrate to the company that this was nothing that they had to do? Or in the event that it gets dropped off um, by one of your trucks and it's significantly damaged. You know, I guess I, I just don't want the back and forth between, hey, you know, your guys damaged my, my tote versus I damaged my tote. And I get another multitude of, of phone calls. Because personally, if it's my garbage can, hey, you know what? I know how I take care of it and I don't take care of it. I can honestly say most of the guys drop things off decently. But then again, I've chased some of my cans down the road when they've been just tossed over on their side and they roll away. So... These don't roll. They're, they're square. Yeah, so they no, don't I, know, roll. I know what you're saying. You know, these are large things, but, you know, I have my own recycling uh, bins. Um, I, I guess for me, I feel like there's just been some poor communication between the residents and Eagle. And so, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just a little bit hesitant, but, you know, after what you've discussed a little bit, I think I, I'm, I'm pretty much split down the middle. Any trash cans that we damage or anything, we would definitely replace. Um, you know, and then the other ones would just be on a case by case, but you know, we would generally err on the side of replacing them. I and then, and these are really heavy duty cans. I mean, they really hold up a lot. Okay. Yeah, I guess I think, I think you could run this thing over with a truck and you wouldn't hurt it. All right. <laughs> I have yes. one, and it's 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 amazingly it's pretty sturdy, uh, durable. Yeah, yeah. I, I have one too. Yeah, they could take it. They could take a beating. I mean, it, it, Andy, do you have a, a good response in your community to these totes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 96 gallons are big. They're big. Yeah. So the only thing, you know, if you're maybe elderly, you might have uh, some issues with it, depending on how much how much trash is in there. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, they're 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 certainly durable. Um, they are very difficult to be knocked over with, you know, even a high wind. Okay. Uh, the recycling can, I have, I think what, what Andrew was talking about, I have one of those too. There's a little, little lighter, um, but uh, yeah, you could fit a ton of recycling there. So yeah, there's been a good response. I think as long as we could get a good message out to our community saying that this is what we're going to try, I don't have as much a problem with it. I'll stick my my self-purchased garbage cans in my garage and we'll see what happens down the road as far as a contract. I was gonna say, if your can's in good shape, stack them together and stick them in the corner of the garage just in case you need them in three years. Yeah. My guess is though that once people see how easy this is and how, how much it's gonna help them, they'll never go back. They'll be begging us to keep it. Okay. So at this point, it's um, it's sounding like the two of you are erring on trying to coordinate this with, with Eagle for start of the next year. I mean, I'm willing to give it a try. Worst case scenario, you know, people don't like it and they store their garbage cans in their garage and we do something different when the contract is up. But if Andrew is willing to kind of say, hey, down the road, when it comes to contract renewal, he's going to work with us to get a good bid out there, then, you know, something like that we might get positive feedback from the residents about. And because we know when we, we get negative feedback, everyone calls in. So 
you know, if, if there's nothing, yeah, it's it's not often you get positive feedback. Right. right. So, so we know if there's not much in the way of phone calls, then we know we're doing something right. Okay. So do I see a motion from either of you then? I, I'd be willing to give it a chance. So are I you making second that. Okay, so, so that's not a motion. Yeah, I was just saying, so I, Irene, if you're if you're going to make the motion, um, clear, precise statement of of what we're what we're agreeing to and approving. I'd like to make the motion to allow Eagle Disposal to provide us with bins, both for trash as well as recycling, that utilize their special arm to make the uh, trash pickup more easy until the end of the term of our current contract. I'll second that. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. Okay, motion carried. Thank you very much for your time, Andrew. We look forward to working with Eagle going forward. And if you could send us a, a, a PDF copy or a stack of printouts or something like that, we are going to be doing a bulk mailer towards the end of the year for some other changes that are, are happening within the township. And we'd be delighted to slip that in there as a notice to the residents at that time as well. Okay. Thank okay. you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the Stormwater Management Waiver Request for 851 Canal Road. Uh, this was for Mark Koch and Stacy Price. This lot was part of the subdivision of Eugene Swope's farm back in 2000. Uh, Mr. Koch purchased the property in 2019 and built a new home. Um, Craig uh, from McCarthy Engineering is present as uh, we, we have some, some questions and things we I think we need to, to go over about the the stormwater waiver. It's, it's not quite as cut and dry as some of the, the other ones tend to be. Uh, so Craig, uh, if you could give us a, a real high level overview of uh, really what the situation is and what the, the ask is from the homeowners. Okay. The, um, the homeowner got a building permit to construct his home. At the time, he was not informed that he needed to do stormwater management according to the township's stormwater management ordinance. Uh, he didn't become aware of that requirement until it was time for them to get their occupancy permit. So it was extremely late in the game, okay? Um, we didn't know at McCarthy Engineering that it was even being constructed until uh, our inspector, Sean Schwartz, was driving by one day and saw them installing the septic system in the backyard. Um, so our involvement didn't happen until basically the end of the process. Um, we at that time notified Kraft Code and the Cucks, uh, Mr. Cuck and uh, Ms. Price, that um, they needed to comply with our stormwater management ordinance. Uh, at that point, there was a lot of back and forth between the Cucks and uh, Mr. Cuck and the, and the township. And um, it ended up that they decided to submit a request for a waiver from the stormwater management ordinance. We did the review uh, of that waiver request and because the township is responsible to make sure that the township is complying with MS4 requirements through the, you know, of the state, we don't normally recommend this type of a waiver. Um, the applicants came into the uh, planning commission meeting to discuss the waiver request, and it became pretty obvious to me that the planning commission was hesitant to rule one way or the other, to make a recommendation one way or the other. Uh, so I made the suggestion that perhaps they could waive the ordinance itself and only require what I'm calling an abbreviated stormwater design. This is, a, this is something we have used in other municipalities and it's really not that uncommon throughout Berkshire County, but it's something different than the township has ever used. 
And basically the difference between this and our normal stormwater ordinance is that this is something a homeowner can prepare themselves. If they have rudimentary skills in, in math, math um, it's, it's pretty easy to fill out the um, uh, calculations and submit them and then determine what size facilities they need. Everything's listed in this, um, in, in the um, instructions uh, that I sent around for everyone to look at. I mean, Mr. Cuck has not seen this yet, okay? I didn't want to provide it to anybody outside of the township before the township approved it. So, um, but basically what'll end up happening is the way this is set up, is that um, the, uh, uh, th there'll end up being a few seepage beds at the corners where the downspouts come down, the front of the roof and the back of the roof. And then generally there's a seepage trench along the driveway. That's, you, that's, that's how these things come out. So if there's any questions about that, I'll be glad to elaborate, but um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I gotta say, just from looking through it and reviewing it, I'm 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 liking the the prospect of doing the waiver for the ordinance and using that abbreviated plan. That kind of strikes me as the common sense approach to this particular situation, and would be something that I, I think, uh, as a as a precedent, would be useful in the future for the township for any any similar sort of circumstances. Um, Jim, Irene, do you have any questions around that? I guess in comparison to what would have been a well conventional thought out plan, in your professional opinion, uh, Craig, do you think that we're missing anything significant when it comes to doing an alternate plan? I mean, I know it's one of those things like you, you can't really undo what was done, but I mean, I guess in your professional opinion, do you think that this is are we being as compliant as we possibly can at this stage in the game? Maybe I'm not just phrasing that well. No, I think the, the takeaway on that, Irene, that you're asking is by doing this, are we, are we deficient in any aspect? Yeah. Are we shooting ourselves in the foot by doing it this alternative way? I think, it, well, the answer to that is, is no, I do not believe so, okay? Um, as I said, we've used this in other municipalities, and what this does is it allows the township to say to DEP, look, we, we make everybody do these. We make everybody do it, okay? And, and basically what this amounts to is this whole uh, procedure uh, amounts to a way to inexpensively and easily comply with um, recharge requirements, groundwater recharge requirements, and it helps. It, it helps to maintain the hydrologic regime of the watershed, um, and and the whole thing is based on 0.46 inches of water runoff from impervious surfaces, because in this part of Berks County, most of Berks County actually, 0.46 inches of runoff is what is estimated to be the average amount of infiltration during a rain event. So what we're doing is we're replicating that. We're taking that 0.46 inches of water, putting it in a smaller location, but giving it more time to infiltrate. Um, you don't generally have to worry about rate control for something this small. Um, same thing with um, uh, stream bank erosion. Um, it it ju just generally doesn't come into play. So I think what we're doing here is 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 giving ourselves a, a real viable option to, uh, as as Mr. Cook said at the planning commission meeting, it was a, a twelve thousand dollar design fee to do to meet the, the to meet the letter of the ordinance, compared to a I don't know a few hundred hours in time spent to fill out the forms. Um, I think it's a good option. And Jim was actually kind of excited about the whole prospect of using this. The planning commission recommended this, correct? Yes. Yes, they did. Yeah, that's what I thought. So this, this Craig, would not be any sort of black mark on our um, 
MS4 reporting requirements or pollution, pollution reduction plan or anything like that? No. Okay. I'm in favor of it. Jim, Irene, what are your thoughts? Like it's the only option that we can think at this point, so. Excuse me, one second. Yes, sir. Uh, at the meeting on Tuesday night, <clears throat> I picked up a, a, a paper with some uh, engineered sketching of the like, small scale stormwater basins. Is that the same thing that Craig's talking about is something different now. It's it, Craig, stop me if I'm wrong, but I'm, it's probably very similar. What he's referring to is there's catch basins and dry wells and things like that. That's that correct. It's, is, it's very similar. It's just a little more detail. It tells you how to actually calculate and size these things. So it's about a it's about a six page little brochure that tells you how to size it and and what you need to do to calculate those sizes. Uh, it also has very similar details as to what are on that form that you got at the planning commission meeting. Okay. It's very similar. Yeah. That, so, that's what, it seems like it's just lacking the, the formula for. Yeah. Correct. Uh, yeah. I'm looking yeah. at it right now. Craig was kind enough to share it with the board. It's, it's very straightforward. It's basic calculations around like uh, roof areas, front, rear, driveway, et cetera, which then just goes into a, a relatively simple like algebra formula for recharge rate is uh, the 0 0.42 inches divided by 12 gives you your your total number of cubic feet of recharge and that's what tells you the the sizing around the the basin that you need um so yeah, I've, I, already, I've already basically started this uh, this uh, system i have a sizable hole already dug with the pipes run into it at, at this point so I guess it's just a matter of knowing, is it big enough or does it need to be bigger? Or, and also I mentioned to the planning commission that I, sometime in the near future, I'd like to uh, submit a permit for a pole building as well. And so I'd like to coordinate all this together. So down the road, we don't go through the same thing again, you know? So I'll, I'll, I wanna calculate all those square footages together and, and uh, and get a jump on it right away. Okay, so for the purposes of what you're doing now, uh, and Craig, stop me if I'm wrong, you may want to, to do that in two pieces simply because you're, you're, you'd be over calculating until that pole building is in. Yeah, and, and what, it's going to kind of complicate things if you try and include things that you're not building now. Yeah. Um, okay. only, because, only because, you know, the, the whole concept is that if you have a peak roof, you have a facility at one or one, you know, the, the one corner in the front and one corner in the back. Well, you're you don't have those corners right now. So if you if you lump everything together, okay, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with two huge holes for the house and no hole for the pole building. Do you see what I mean? So yeah. you I, I, I was I was always under the impression that. Uh, you didn't. You didn't need four separate holes for each downspout, or do you? You know, I thought. I thought we just run into one bigger. You know. Well, and and that's a possibility, okay. But I thought that was what you were trying to avoid. I mean, that that's going to be more expensive up front to okay. to construct something like that, and I thought that was what you were trying to avoid. So, this would give you the option of breaking it up and doing it in smaller pieces. Yeah, alternatively, if you are looking at that one centralized point, um, not an engineer here, but you could certainly run the calculations. And I think it's a minimum size, Craig. It's not that you can't oversize. It's like- Oh, no, you, you can oversize it if you yeah, like. Yeah. You, can always, you can always exceed and run the rough numbers on your own so that you know that you have capacity. But I would do that cautiously simply because you may have a situation where you decide for a larger pole building or you decide not to do the pole building. It, right. You do that at your own peril, but it's it's pretty straightforward for, for the purposes of what we're going to be approving here. The The minimum requirement that, that you would have to do should be relatively easy to achieve. 
you know, the other thing is, you know, I, what my concern when you start talking about a pole building is, I, I, of course, I have no idea what size you're talking about. I have no idea what the scale of this thing is. And I have no idea what you intend to use it for. So I, what I'm concerned about is that if depending on the size and the use, you may end up being in a position where you actually need to go through land development for that pole building. Okay, depending on, on, you know, I mean, it's, it's fine to build a residential garage or a shed, okay, as a residential accessory use, but depending on what the use of this pole building is going to be and the size of it, okay, you may be into a position where you need to go through land development, and at that point, this little minor thing that we're talking about here does not apply. Right. You would need to go actually do complete stormwater calculations. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So, circling back to uh, Jim and Irene, um, Irene, you had weighed in that just this is basically really the only viable option to address this. Jim, what are your thoughts on it? I agree with that. Okay. So, let me uh, take a second here to figure out my exact wording for making the motion, but then I'll, I'll make a motion. Okay, uh, I'll make a motion to allow 851 Canal Road to have the re normal requirements of the Marion Township Stormwater Management Ordinance waived and in substitution submit a an abbreviated stormwater management plan. Second that. Sure. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay, Craig, if you can follow up uh, with the homeowner and get them the, the packet. I was, was going to ask Mark, Mark, can you send an email to Susan at the township and then have her forward to me so I have your email address? Monday morning, I will then forward this packet to you. Yeah, I'll do that. No problem. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next item on the agenda is the uh, website. Uh, we've been continuing to provide content to Civic CMS and we were intending to meet with them over the past uh, couple of weeks. However, uh, it's mostly been my work schedule, which has been the limiting factor there. I have not had a, a free point in the evening uh, to get connected with everybody simultaneously. So the goal here is to do that next week. Uh, Work generally slows down around Thanksgiving a little little bit for me, so I might have some breathing room to meet with everybody in the evening with Civic CMS around the training for the website. Uh, otherwise, the development is going quite well. The, the structural elements, the, the skeleton of the site is in place. We have a lot of content that we've given over. There's still more content that we have to produce that just hasn't existed previously. Uh, one of the things that we had been discussing was some additional content and, and visual assets around like who the supervisors are, the, the road crew, the fire company, things like that to make the, the website a little less stark and uh, utilitarian, I guess would be the right word, that we're not just all content about ordinances and this and that and the other thing, that there's a certain human element to it. Um, so I will work with uh, Lisa from Civic CMS on getting something scheduled. I'll again be in contact with you guys to see if there's a night of the week that, that works for you and I can get out of work sometime before like 8 p.m. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be in touch with everybody and uh, we'll, we'll go from there, but we're, we're on the home stretch for that. It's, it's pretty close to the finish line. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Yeah. Okay, phenomenal. Uh, next item is the website. Uh, excuse me, not the website, road, road project. We just did the website. Uh, the road projects for, for 2020, uh, we are gonna be putting out to bid for 2021 soon. Uh, there is one final little bit of, of measuring and math that we have to do to add to the packet um, around some un underlying remedial work for some of the roads. Um, I have some preliminary measurements that we had gotten from Franklin and from uh, another company. However, we were unable to get additional uh, estimates provided to, to go in with that. So we're just going to snap it into the bid packet. 
again, function of time. I've not had a, a chance to go out with a, a measuring tape or one of the, the measuring wheels and measure areas to get a, a square yardage count. But uh, uh, Scout's Honor, I will do that as soon as possible, uh, possibly on a, a weekend where there, it's a, a relatively sunny day out. Um, Irene and Jim, if you'd like to go along for a, a, a ride and uh, check out some roads, we can, we can make a, an outing of it. Um, and that's really the last thing we need to do to get that packet out the door. For everybody's consideration, though, because we, when we talk budget, we're going to talk uh, pretty ex extensively about the amount of money that we want to throw at, at road work next year. Um, we are going to want to put together an actual packet for 2021 because this is the assembled uh, carryover from 2019 and 2020 that we will still have bandwidth to do other projects in 2021 as well. Granted, we're, we're not by any stretch of the uh, imagination um, overfunded. There's a surplus of things to do, but we will have some space, some capacity left over to be able to do some additional projects, whether it's targeting a couple of culverts, doing some additional uh, tar and chip, things like that. That uh, I, I urge you guys in your travels around the township, take stock of areas that you feel are particularly uh, well-traveled or worn and uh, start getting a list together and we'll, we'll assess where that fits into the, the hierarchy of cost and uh, feasibility. I'm not allowed to mention Sheridan Road, right? Oh no, you can mention Sheridan Road. Um, the one thing that I would say just in, in full unbiased honesty is uh, there are a couple of roads that I've been avoiding. The, the sewer is a, a hot topic and the the reality that we have to face as supervisors is while we're going to be trying to do things to, to protect the citizens from uh, a potentially overly costly project, the reality does remain that we have to consider that we could face a public sewer, whether it's five years down the road, 15 down, down the road, 30 down the road, doesn't matter. We need to keep that in our kind of our playbook of the roads. So Sheridan, while it's in pretty dire need of repair, a good stretch of that road is going to be on the path of the sewer if and when the sewer happens. So I wouldn't want to necessarily go through and do a complete repave on that road only to have to tear it up in five years or 10 years. Um, simply because uh, road work, as you guys know, other than like oil and chip, which is pretty cost effective, is really, really, really expensive. Um, Craig, keep me honest, this is a statistic from a couple of years ago, but to, to do a full depth repave, which a lot of our roads, uh, when we oil and chip, it's, it's essentially a band-aid. A lot of them need to be done as a full depth reclamation. And that's about $400,000 a mile. Yeah, that's not, uh, that, that's not uncommon, yeah. Yeah, so uh, when, we're, when we're looking at that kind of commitment to do something right, to actually fix it, we wanna make sure that we're not doing something that's gonna get marred or torn up or, or ruined essentially in short order thereafter. So I know there's stretches of Sheridan Road on the, the opposite side of like William Penn Boulevard that are also particularly bad that are not in the path of the sewer, but there are some other unique constraints that exist on that stretch of road around the trees and how uh, water and ice just kind of thaw, freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, freeze. So short of doing a, a substantial project in grading and cutting down a lot of trees along that roadway, if we repaved, we'd have the same problem probably inside of a year. Canal so, road is canal road's pretty bad too in spots. Oh, believe me, Jim, I know. <laughs> um, that's uh, there's some spots where uh, the, the the drainage. I don't know if it's ever been right on that road where it just it collects right. on the wrong side of the road and, and creates a, a pond um, and then you have spots where there's just routine and repeated potholes but that's another one that again by the nature of being in the potential area for the sewer I from a, a slightly selfish standpoint would love it if it was repaved because I, I drive that anytime I, I come and go from from the house um, but I, I don't know if it would be the best bang for our buck right now. Great. But we do need to find a way to at least oh, yeah. make it drivable. Oh yeah, no, completely agree. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. And just in the in the course of driving around and making a list, please don't take anything out of the equation. Call out Sheridan, call out Canal, because not everything has to be a huge project where it's a full depth. It could be something as simple as 
like I know Al Ferrandino had complained about Marion Drive there, water collecting and running into his yard. It could be something as simple as we know this is a problem. Let's put McCarthy Engineering to task on what the solution is and if it's something that our road crew can do with the right permitting and permissions and everything in place to just go out and regrade it. Easy enough. That's a, a function largely of, of manpower and time rather than material. So everything and anything, there, there is no bad suggestion here. Call it out and we'll, we'll review it, assess it, and try to get an action plan in place. Okay, Irene, anything? I'm okay. good to drive with you. Very good. Next up on the agenda is the RKL contract. The RKL contract expires at the end of the year this year on December 31st. Uh, we have received proposals for our RKL and from Aikens Accounting. Uh, Irene, I'll, I'll turn it over to you since you had actually done a lot of the, the legwork on, on getting those proposals. And the contracts are so similar. Um, Aikens would be essentially offering us the same exact service from RKL. The cost difference is about close to $3,000 um, better for us. So, and Aikens is also offering us a discount if we have a uh, multi-year uh, contract. So we can do the same thing as we did with RKL, span it out for three years, and it'll give us a better cost over time. Okay. I... Uh had a, a chance to look over the proposals side by side for RKL. Uh, Jim, did you get a chance to do likewise? Yes. Yeah, there's a significant difference. Yeah, and it's it's the same service too. It's not like we're right. we're questionable in any areas. It's it's pretty much an, a direct apples to apples comparison. Um, Irene did a great job with that. Yeah, it was very thorough. Thank you, Irene. So. At this point, uh, we can either do it now or we can do it in December, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to just get it out of the way that uh, we'll make a motion to switch over to Aikens Accounting as the, uh, the auditing contract uh, starting in 2021. Second. Roll call, Peter. Hi. Irene. Hi. Irene. Can you hear me? No. Yep. Hi. Okay. Jim. Hi. Peter, would you care to see, say the amount just for the public so they know where their money's being spent? Certainly. Let me, let me scroll down to where that is. Irene, if you beat me to it, feel free to, to chime in. Okay, so the the cost for RKL, as listed in the, the fee schedule, is in 2020, $8,750. In 2021, $9,000. And 2022, $9,250. Uh, Aikens came in with an estimate, or I should say quote, not an estimate, um, of, and I, I feel I just scrolled right by it. Um, it's on the last page. Yes, yes, fee proposal. Thank you. Uh, the quoted fee for Aikens is $5,960 uh, for a three-year agreement, and they would limit the increase to no more than 2% each year, which is a very, very large difference. So great, great find, great uh, effort on Irene's part to get us an additional cost efficiency. That's an extra couple thousand dollars that we can put to more useful things in the budget. Not that the audit isn't a necessary and useful thing, but if that's an extra $3,000 that we can put towards roads, the building, the park, any number of things, it's $3,000 better spent in my mind. Okay. You're okay if I reach out to Aikens and let them know then. Yes, that was actually, thank you. I, I kind of diverged there for a second. Um, that was on my, my notes to ask you that if it was approved to reach out to them so that they're prepped and ready to go with anything that they would need to do the start of 2021. Give them the essentially the extra month of lead time to get prepped. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next up is the Western Berks Planning Commission. Uh, they're actually meeting at the same time as we are tonight. The past couple of months, I have been in attendance to represent the, the changes. Um, I was intending to be there tonight, but because of just the timing on us moving forward a week because of Thanksgiving, uh, we had the, the scheduling conflict. Um, I did, however, send them an email that addressed the concerns that they had voiced at the last meeting, as well as a, a pointed statement that we are, as a township, 
uh, interested in moving forward with adopting as we had stated and has had pre presented previously. Um, the Planning Commission for Marion Township met on Tuesday and uh, recommended that the Board of Supervisors adopt the ordinance for, for that joint zoning. So we'll have to follow up with the Western Berks Planning Commission to make sure that everything went smoothly tonight. But uh, assuming everything else being equal, the next step would be uh, to coordinate with them on uh, a meeting where we, have, we would have to have quorum for each one of the municipalities that is represented to adopt the joint zoning. Okay, uh, Jim, Irene, questions? No, I get, there was a little confusion okay. as to the date initially. Yeah, yeah, for, for whatever reason, we all had it on our calendars as Tuesday, but it was actually Thursday. So it is what it is, life goes on, but uh, we should be in good space there as we had replied to any of their uh, questions in writing rather than me being there in person. Um, Craig, I was there oh, Tuesday. Right. I had a nice surprise. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> I pulled in the parking lot and there was no cars. Oh, oh, okay. oh man. I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 I thought we had emails circulating about that. I probably should have called <laughs> you. You. <laughs> you may have. You may have. And I uh, just missed it. Next, no time, next time I will call you, Jim. Although hopefully <laughs> there isn't a next time. Um, I think the next meeting is scheduled for December. 17th okay which is a thursday yep. and i i don't think that that conflicts with our december. no no our, our december meeting we ended up moving that one out rather than forward uh so that one is the 30th of mm -hmm. december okay but the december 17th meeting might be the one where they have that public hearing yeah uh, where where i believe north heidelberg and potentially marion would be adopted so um, I think the intent is to get everybody together and have a quorum, like you said, Peter, and then and get it done. There's also another one that came out. Um, I don't know if this is on the agenda from, from Rob Zonia. So that's a third um, proposed amendment. I don't know that that one will be done in time uh, for December 17th, because that just went out recently to the Berks County Planning Commission and all the other uh, municipalities. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, that, relates, that relates to something just specifically in Ravazonia with a property that Grande is uh, developing into uh, what's called an active adult retirement community. It's basically 92 units, mixture of duplexes and apartments. Okay. Yeah, I know the last time that I was at the meeting, I had extended the, the statement that if there were a reason that uh, we had to delay past December, Ultimately, that's okay. We want to we want to mm -hmm. play nice with the rest of the group. So if they said, you know, the Robazonia thing, we're going to need until January to do. Yeah. Okay. That's it's not it's not hurting anybody to wait, and we'd rather do everything all at once because it just makes a lot more sense from an efficiency standpoint. Well, yep. The only ordinance that plan our planning commission had um, that they recommended you adopt was the one with the active adult residential. Um, community in Robizonia. That's the only one I was given that had, I believe that it had our name on it, um, and we were to adopt that in the event that we then join the joint zoning. Right, so that, I kind of, I wrote it two ways. I wrote it one with Marion and one without Marion. I just couldn't predict the timing of everything. So I wasn't sure how it was going to work. So at this point, we don't have to do anything. Our planning okay. commission doesn't have to review it. We're not technically a part of, of the ordinance at this point. So okay. I just sent it out to, to everybody. Just in okay. case. The, planning, the planning commission did review it um, on Tuesday night and recommended it. So mm -hmm. okay. we already, the, the supervisors have the planning commission's recommendation. Yeah. Well, it's essentially I mean, pre-approved then. <laughs> When it, yeah, whenever it's ready. Okay. Yeah, it's just one of, the, one of the requirements of, of, you know, officially getting this adopted is that at least you, you give the opportunity of the planning commissions to make comments. If they don't make comments, fine. Um, if they do, then you consider them. So. Okay. Okay. So we'll have to follow up, uh, whether it's me or you, Sue. We just have to send an email to them asking them for a status update if we're going to be looking at adoption in December or January, and then we'll coordinate our schedules appropriately. 
I could ask her for an agenda, I guess. Um, okay. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how fast they turn around the meeting minutes, but like agenda and meeting minutes, because I know I know we're on the agenda for sure. Okay. But okay. Next item up on the agenda is the old furnace. Uh, I did call several companies. Uh, I've actually been playing phone tag with Carl Keith over the past two days. Um, we get, did get somebody from Essig out to take a look at it, and they did provide an estimate. It's not a outlandish amount that they're they're asking for to uh, disconnect the old heating system. Uh, that would entail uh, cutting and capping the oil lines that come in from outside disconnecting the water lines from the, the boiler itself and the radiator lines, making sure that they're bled, as well as disconnecting and pulling back to the, the closest junction box, any electrical and wiring. Um, the gentleman from Essig was kind enough while he was out to do some preliminary stuff to make sure that the, the system wasn't making any strange noises to bother Sue during the day. So uh, it is now turned off and uh, shut off in such a way that it, it's not going to have water actively in it anymore, but it is still... Uh, still very much connected to the supply lines for the various uh, things for that heater. Um, do we want to have me continue Chase Carl, uh, Chase Carl Keith going forward, or do we want to potentially look at just having Essig come in and disconnect the unit and move on with the rest of, of what we've got going on? Safety standpoint, um, what is the best recommendation, I guess? Well, we definitely want to disconnect it. The question oh, is, do we, the same. Yeah. we have to disconnect it? I mean, is there the need for some other kind of a hazard to have it physically removed, or can it just sit there and collect dust like everything else? I mean, it can sit there and collect dust. The, the, the big thing is we can put it out for scrap metal for the most part. The, the only concern would be, and I think, Sue, you had said that there was previously studies done on the, the insulation down there on the pipes, and it's not asbestos that that was done right before i started with the township and the, the report said there was no asbestos down there okay because it, it looks pretty asbestosy but mm -hmm. we have to defer to the experts on this but other than the potential you know, i can i can try to find that report and email it to you guys okay um, I, I wouldn't say high level of urgency because to, to your point irene other than doing something like disconnecting it from water and oil and power just to prevent like potential leaks or fire hazard situations there's really not a strong driving force for us to take it out other than just to 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 be done with it essentially mm -hmm. to to finally put it to rest um cutting off the the water lines would allow us to start taking out things like the radiators the old radiators the the old steam boilers that are in the meeting room that take up some floor space there uh the pipes we could remove the pipes that are doing things like blocking that light switch in the office um a number of things that we just we shouldn't start cutting into it when we potentially have a, a live line or something that could become charged after it was cut. It wasn't a significant expense. No, it's the the total is less than six hundred dollars to have them yeah. come in and, and do this. I would say let's just get it done, be done with it. Okay. One less thing to worry about. Would you like to make a motion, Jim? I'd like to make a motion that uh, we that we have Essig come in and disconnect the old furnace and uh, at a cost of whatever it was, $600 it was, less than it was, $600. It was $596 even. $596, correct. I'll second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay, hey, next up on the agenda is the garage lights. Uh, so we, we did actually go out and do some cleanup. Uh, Irene, I don't know if you got a chance to see the garage. Um, we've made a, a serious amount of progress. The, the next big thing is we need to get Elk Environmental or whatever other company that's gonna collect the hazardous chemicals out. Um, we did kind of collect them in two spots. There's some in the front of that uh, secondary garage bay and, and a lot in the back. Um, the main area of the garage, we did a pretty good job with cleaning, scraping, sweeping, etc. What we need to do next, and I'll, I'll make the segue to the garage lights in just a second, is uh, do some additional organizing and cataloging and uh, uh, some additional things in terms of utility around shelves, countertop, pegboard for hanging tools, things like that, um, and hanging the lights. I was trying to hang the lights that Saturday, but we do not have a ladder that is tall enough to reach the ceiling. So I'm still is, willing. Is there, is there a ladder up on the second floor? 
I'll be honest. I think there's, I think there's a ladder up there. I didn't look, but if Second memory floor, you know, the main building. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If memory serves me, when Peter Wallace did the the two lights that he did put up, I think he had one of his ladders. Oh, you're, you um, might be right. Yeah. Because I think the one upstairs is an older, like extendable ladder rather than an A frame. If I'm uh, not mistaken. I don't know. I'd have to go up I'd and look. So. I'd have to look. But the the reason I ask this is is everybody okay with me buying a ladder if we don't have one that reaches the ceiling in the garage? I'm okay. Sure. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. As long as there's a place you could safely put it out of the way. <laughs> so you had to make this difficult, yeah. Irene. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I would like I don't have a problem with that as long as there's a safe place that you could store it so it's out of the way. Yeah. We can probably hang it on the wall in the secondary garage if I got some hooks for it. Because I think there's nothing on the walls. It's just it's gonna be kind of a pain to get to when like the grater and everything is in there. But it would be up and out of the way to that point. Um, but I, I showed up tools in hand, ready to go. And the only thing I could find was like a six foot ladder. I'm like, well, this is not gonna, <laughs> this is not gonna work at all. So uh, I honestly, off the top of my head, don't know what that kind of ladder is gonna cost. I've not bought a ladder like that for many, 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 many years. Wait, how but, tall of a ladder do you need? Oh, geez, I think it's like a 12 foot ceiling in there. John, uh, 12 foot ladder, how price range on that? John says 150, 200, uh, 150, 200, uh, the most for a 300 pound rating ladder. Okay, and we're talking a frame ladder rather than. Yeah, where yeah. are you get it at? Uh, Ace Hardware, Home Depot. Okay, so just for the the sake of wiggle room, are you guys okay with uh, somebody making a motion to authorize an expense of like three hundred dollars for a ladder, up to three hundred dollars for a ladder? I will make a motion to purchase a ladder for up to $300, so long as it has its own place where it is stored <laughs> and stored safely in the building. <laughs> I'll second that. Oh, boy. <laughs> Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. Next up on the agenda is the 2020 reorganizational meeting for the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we set the date for this at the workshop meeting. The meeting has to be held on the uh, first Monday in January, which is the fourth. We are gonna be having that uh, via telepresence, just like these meetings at 7 p.m. In, in like kind, the 2021 reorganizational meeting for the auditors has been set for Tuesday, which re is required to be the day following the Board of Supervisors meeting uh, for January 5th, 2021, also at 7 p.m. Uh, by the nature of the auditors and their, their technology situation, uh, we will be doing a, a hybrid model where we will have the building open for the auditors. Uh, we don't expect a, a large turnout for the auditor meeting. I don't know that we've had a single person other than uh, potentially a supervisor show up to an auditor meeting for a number of years now. Uh, but we will be recording and broadcasting the meeting via Zoom in the same capacity that we do with the supervisor meeting, but just be doing it from the township building, um, which means uh, Sue and I will be there uh, to provide whatever support we need in terms of opening and closing the building, wiping things down, etc. cetera. Uh, but otherwise it will be largely self-governing in the sense that we'll, we'll set up a laptop, start the, start the broadcast and let them do their thing. So I'm going to advertise that as the meeting is at the municipal building. Okay, and that's fine. I can, okay. if you want, we can cannibalize the, the wording for the Zoom meeting too, but I honestly don't know that it's necessary. We can just advertise it. I was it just gonna the... advertise the Board of Supervisors meeting as via Zoom. Okay. Um, then I'll word it something like I did, um, with the Zoom notification, you know, should, I mean, I could put the yeah. I mean, if we're I could if put the ID number in. Yeah, and so you can you can view the Zoom meet. You can uh, attend the meeting through Zoom by using the the code. Like, we, if you want, you can connect with me on the wording. But I don't think anybody's going to take us up on it. But the option will still be there. Right. Um, I personally like the the recording of the meetings because it, it gives us a, a nice uh, immutable record. Yeah. And it's very uh, interactive and user-friendly for anybody who wasn't able to attend the meeting. They can go in and, and watch it on YouTube at, at their leisure, usually within a, a day or so after the meeting mm -hmm. happened. And we, we do get people attending the, um, in the past, we've gotten people attending the Board of Supervisors reorg meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, yeah. nobody attends the auditor's meeting. Yeah. But okay. I will... Um, 
I'll just advertise it as it's in the municipal building. Okay. We can Let's still record it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I use, always use the same code for all the meetings. So yeah. if somebody actually really wanted to, they could relatively easily figure that out too. But uh, yeah. okay. uh, it'll be the, the one exception to the building being closed is it'll be open for the auditor meeting. Okay. Okay, next, uh, we have a, a couple of terms that will be expiring in 2021. Uh, these are to be reappointed at the reorganizational meeting. Uh, the first is for the planning commission. Ryan Allgaier's term is expiring. Next is also the Planning Commission. Franklin Troutman's term is uh, uh, expiring. The zoning hearing, one of the positions on that board is Charles Zeckman, Jr., and that position is expiring. Uh, also on zoning hearing is David Sadison, and for the vacancy board chairman, Nancy Carrington. Uh, Sue reached out to everybody. Uh, Ryan Allgaier expressed an interest to serve another term. Franklin Troutman also expressed an interest to serve another term. Uh, Charles Zeckman Jr., however, is not interested in serving another term on the Zoning Hearing Board. Uh, that particular position is as needed. They don't f meet on like a month-to-month -month basis. It's only as uh, the, the need develops. And it is a little different than some of the other appointments in the Zoning Hearing Board actually is a hearing. It's not a name. It is an actual uh, sworn-in court situation. Um, we as supervisors also cannot serve on that board. There are a number, a number of other exclusions from, uh, if you have one position, you can't overlap with the other. Um, so if there is anybody that you know of that would be interested in that position and would be well suited, is familiar with our zoning or would be willing to get very familiar with our zoning, um, please make either Sue or myself available or uh, knowledgeable of that. And uh, we'll certainly review it at the reorganizational meeting and hopefully be able to appoint somebody to that vacancy. The other two positions, uh, David Sadison on the zoning hearing and Nancy Carrington for the vacancy board, they are both interested in continuing to serve uh, for additional terms. Uh, Jim, Irene, any thoughts, comments, concerns, or suggestions? I'm going to reach out to someone who may know someone that might want to do it. Okay. okay. And I think it goes without saying we don't have to appoint. It's better if we do, but if we have a vacancy, that is, that is a thing that does happen. Um, and uh, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but we could, if we found somebody during the, the latter part of the year, we could appoint to fill a vacancy, correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If there's nothing like to, to thank those, I'd like to thank all those people who have uh, been serving and have expressed a desire to continue to do so. It's very appreciative of their efforts. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, a lot of those are pretty thankless jobs. Like I know the the planning commission is is it's all volunteer. Uh, not that, like for example, the board members we don't I, I don't bill for stuff. Irene doesn't bill for stuff. Jim, you don't bill for stuff. We we get something that we're legally required to take. But beyond that, we're, we're, we're essentially volunteers. We're public servants. Um, everybody else that we listed out is the same situation that uh, they're, they're doing this for the, the betterment of Marion Township more than anything else. Okay. Next up is the winter snow removal. Uh, the trucks are all prepped and ready. Uh, we did receive confirmation on the list of farmers for the emergency snow removal, and it is the same as last year. So Sue, thank you for reaching out to Mervyn and getting confirmation on that. Sure. And uh, I think we're, we're in good shape. We have plenty of road salt left mm -hmm. over from last year, and uh, I'll, I'll find something wooden to knock on at some point that we don't get any snow, but if we do, we should be well prepared. Okay. Next up is the Act 537. Uh, I had circulated a memo to uh, McCarthy Engineering. Uh, Craig, if, if you've seen it, awesome. If you haven't, not a big deal. Uh, I had been in contact with Jim McCarthy off and on over the past couple of months around uh, really how best to present what we want to do to the DEP as a, a sort of means of wetting the, the, the appetite, starting the conversation around uh, making amendments to the plan. Uh, we had a little bit of a conversation early on in the year, right around the, the onset of COVID, that uh, they are willing to virtually sit down with us and go over a preliminary plan review, which is something that they've not been willing to do or have not done for a very long time with, with anybody. 
so the, the, the line of dialogue of communication is, is certainly open and present. And I think we have a, a good situation where we can go and, and pursue a solution that is essentially the olive branch rather than anything else that has been uh, bandied in the past. Um, Irene and Jim, have you gotten a chance to read over? Uh, it's, it's about one page that I, that I had written. I can't seem to pull it up on my... Um, okay, so if you're in the November Board of Supervisors agenda items, I believe it is page 41, which is the, the PDF attachment in the Google Drive. Not the one marked scan. I'll have to, I have to have you help me out with this because I think it just might be, might be user error. Okay, no, that's no problem. I don't mind connecting with you at some point. The other thing I can do if, if you want to, I can either read it out or I can share the screen. Either one's fine by me. Can you share the screen? I think yeah. it would be very yeah. useful. Fine. Okay, give me just a second. I'll get the, get the sharing started. And this way, everyone in the public knows exactly what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Full disclosure. Yeah. Hey, you, excuse me a minute. I'll be back. So don't oh, make certainly. any motions. Don't make certainly. any motions. <laughs> certainly. We won't, won't make any motions. We'll just go over the, uh, the letter. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I can't, I can't seem to pull anything up. What number page was it? Mine is 41. Of 46. Yeah, I don't even have that. Okay, well, here, give me just a second. Now let's do it. I'll do it like this. I have it up. Okay. Maybe I'm getting to it. Down there, pretty far, I mean. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's it's pretty close to the bottom. Okay. I'll grab a glass of water too. Okay. Uh, anybody that can see this in presentation view, is that too close? Are you guys getting stuff cut off by other, like other participants' videos, or is that no, easy that to read? Pretty, that looks pretty good, Peter. Okay, good. Yeah, because I'm. Relatively speaking, flying blind, I see things as the host a little differently than you guys see as the like the, the attendees on the meeting. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm, I'm not going what looks good to me and have it be illegible or, or not really user friendly for you guys. Okay, so while we're waiting for Sue to come back, I'll, I'll just briefly read through it. Uh, hello, DEP. The Board of Supervisors is looking to make several revisions to the existing Act 537 plan. Of these alterations, the largest is to include an initial component within the long-term plan, which addresses the management of our existing on-lot systems under the on-lot management ordinance until the need for a public sewer is determined based on the actual state of the existing systems and a clear financial uh, and clear financial criteria. This period prior to consideration or implementation of a municipal sewer option would be for assessing and managing our existing systems through SEO best technical guidance until such a time that affordability could be achieved. The board also wishes to include more consideration around alternative sewer systems, as well as some concerns around Womeldorf's, uh, Womeldorf's available capacity uh, that have arisen recently. As bullet points, we'd like to amend the plan to outline assessment of need based on current system states and conditions, uh, supported by the on-lot management ordinance, which will give us comprehensive data over the next 36 months and provide improvements over prior processes, none. Uh, assemble additional alternative options for consideration if a sewer is warranted and affordable. Outline clear cost benefit analysis and impact to affected citizens. When a level of need and financial expenditure is feasible and, the, and beneficial for those impacted, the next phase of Act 537 plan would be engaged to install a public sewer. Must include and consider the complete financial impact to those affected by this hookup fee, connection, removal of old system, etc. Timing for this would depend on failure rate and available grant funding. Removal of the West End from the planned area. These properties are on the furthest edge of the planned area and are over the crest of a hill. All lots are capable of supporting current on-lot system requirements and were added during a late stage of the current plans process. 
Bottom line is that if a sewer is needed, Marion will work towards implementing it. However, we must ensure that the plan reflects the citizens' concerns around actual documented need and affordability. We look forward to meeting with you virtually in light of COVID to review our needs. If there are any questions or comments, please notify the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Very good letter, Peter. Thank you. Irene? I think we lost your audio, Irene. Short and to the point. Yeah, I, I tried to not, you don't want to be too heavy with that. You want to kind of spark the conversation rather than, you don't necessarily want to give them war and peace because it, it's not going to get read if you do. Um, so, uh, w welcome back, Sue. Thank you. Um, I just went through the letter, shared it on the screen, read it out. Um, I supplied that over to Jim. I'm waiting to hear back from him if he has any suggestions, having dealt extensively with the DEP, if there's maybe some things that we can tweak or adjust that would particularly uh, resonate well with them to, to get that conversation started. The goal here is to, to go into this cooperatively. Everybody, uh, we have the opportunity where we can have a, a situation where we can exist within current regulations, guidelines, and standards, and everybody be happy. I think we can we can we can get a win out of this all across the board. We just have to be careful, cautious, and polite throughout the entire process. Jim, Irene, uh, if you don't have anything else, we'll move on to the next item. But uh, speak up if you do have something. Thank you. Next up is the County of Berks Municipal Tax Sheet. Uh, we share the printing and postage costs with the county for tax bills. The municipal tax sheet and contact information needs to be completed and sent back no later than December 31st, 2020. Uh, we do need to have the budget uh, accepted and approved before the, we can supply that. Um, Sue, as you and I had talked about, if we advertise the budget, we can kind of pregame some of that stuff so that it's ready to go. Uh, but we really can't submit it until the, the budget has been accepted and approved based on the fact that that's kind of what sets the, the things that are going to be on those tax bills. They don't ask for monetary amounts. They just want to know oh, like the, the millage building. rates. And, yeah. yeah but, um, but still, you know, you need to approve the budget to do that. Yeah, and if we, if we, for whatever reason, didn't do this, our tax bills would come out with no data on that, which yeah. we don't want. Good. Yeah, <laughs> which is, in fact, very bad. Um, so with that said, we'll move on to the next item for discussion. And uh, I, we, we did a lot of prep work on this at, on the Saturday workshop meeting, um, the 2021 budget. Uh, so if you'll tolerate me for just a second, I will share the budget on the screen so that we can all look at it in real time. Okay, so with the budget, I made a couple of uh, updates over the, the past couple of days from the, uh, the workshop meeting. Um, based on current account balances and everything else, um, we have a couple of funds that we're intentionally over allocating on. Uh, the streetlight fund was actually high. It carried a higher balance than it really probably should have. Uh, and we undercut the rate pretty hard in prior years. Um, we had originally talked about a rate of 0.5, and I'll, I'll scroll down. If we leave it at 0.5, the, the deficit uh, for year over year is about $2,600. Um, we wouldn't go negative on the account, not by any stretch of the imagination, but I think we may be undercutting it a little harder than we want to. We want to bring it down to a, a more realistic level, roughly about two times the annual expenditure in the fund. Um, and I'm actually going to suggest that we raise the streetlight frontage cost just slightly to 0.65 for two reasons. It slows down the, the, the rate of reduction in that, that account. We still undercut it by a, a decent amount, but it's not wildly doing that. And it also will ease the transition uh, 
either in 2022 or 2023 when we have to put that at a, an almost one-to-one -one so that the, the income meets the expenses to keep the balance, which would be a rate of roughly either 0 0.90 or 0.91. Right. So, so just doing the math, if you undercut it, if you if you reduce it to 0. 0.65, we're mm -hmm. about $350 off. But yep. um, yeah, there you go. You have the math right there. Yep. yep. Um, and uh, from from the budget, but also uh, utilities go up about 0.14% uh, per year. So just accounting for increase in utility rates. Yeah. So the, the fund the streetlight fund balance at the end of 2020 is estimated to be about $8,602 and 64 cents. Yeah. So if we were at a rate of 0.5, actually, yeah. hold on. This is, this is why Excel is wonderful. I can change this and it'll tell me at a rate of about 0.5, we'd be undercutting by about $2,600, yeah. which puts the account balance a little lower than I would like to see at the end of 2021. By changing it to 0.65, it doesn't slow it down a huge amount, but it does slow it down a, a little bit. It's about, just about $1,000. Um, as we start to go, like I said, in 2022 or 2023, we're going to need to probably go to a rate of 0.91, I believe is where we would be in, in the clear by about $30 at current rate. If we have any sort of increase, which you do tend to have annual year over year cost increases on everything, not just electrical service, uh, we would probably be right at where it would need to be with 0.91, whether it's next year or the year following. So my, my personal suggestion is we go with a, a rate of 0.65 for the frontage, just to keep okay. that, that account in good standing. Yeah, as soon as you sent that math over, I was like, yes. Okay, Jim, do you have any questions, comments, concerns? No, I agree. I think, you're, I think you've made it a good adjustment there. Okay, fantastic. Uh, as for millage, I think we should keep the millage at two. We should not raise or decrease the taxes. Uh, one, I'm not generally in favor of tax increases. And two, um, we have a, a number of things that we, we could use the, the funding for. Um, so at current rate, our budget for the general fund is a total expense of uh, $609,134.46. And we would be looking at an estimated revenue of $609,975.80. So we're, we're very close. We would be operating at a, a surplus of only $841.34. Uh, but please note that we, we very uh, carefully estimated and projected a lot of the, the cost uh, figures and revenue figures for next year. There are a number of things that could potentially be higher, whether it's uh, earned income, uh, which I think we're actually okay on this year, but we have seen delays. We're actually probably expecting more this year than we've already been paid out, uh, largely around just the delays a lot of things have seen with the coronavirus. Uh, but we won't, don't wanna, uh, figuratively speaking, count our chickens before they hatch. So we've estimated conservatively on the incomes and uh, a little on the high side for everything and anything on the uh, uh, expense side of things. That way we're offered a higher degree of certainty around not spending more than we take in. So with that said, the only thing that I really wanted to highlight is I did adjust the amount for the building repairs, maintenance services, and the highway construction and wages, or excuse me, the highway construction yeah, a little bit. The size of yes, the I'm sorry. That's yeah. Okay. Once again, it's, it's difficult for view. It looks different for me than it does for you guys. Um, so I, I adjusted some figures there where if we had any additional costs in things that we, we had nothing in 2019, 2020, 2020, or nothing anticipated in 2021. And I reallocated those things to those two funds because I figured of the things that we're going to be focusing on, uh, road work and building maintenance are probably going to be the, the two highest ones. Um, don't let me forget during the, the end part of the meeting, I do want to bring up that uh, matching grant source that Jim McCarthy pointed out to us today, which I think is going to be a wonderful thing for us to try to pursue 
in next year or for a number of things around the building. Um, Jim or Irene, do you have any questions around the the budget? Can you scroll back down under yep. the police fire? I thought during the, um, right there, the highlighted row under police, I thought we were gonna include a breakout on that one for um, the 12,000 that it costs us for dispatching. Yes. Yeah, I thought it was just gonna create uh, the extra cost there, uh, the, extra category there under police. Yeah, yeah that, that should actually be there, hold on. Yeah. Bear with me for just, yeah, I was, I've gone cross-eyed at this summit for the past couple of days, so um, I know it's there. I know it's there. Um, like ants on a page. Yep. Yeah. I had to walk away from it when I was doing it in the office with Dan the one day. Yeah, because I know Dan and I actually set the uh, the new codes for the... Oh. The okay. things that we we set up, we didn't put them in QuickBooks yet, but we okay. actually went through the, the the PA chart of accounts, and okay. and figured out what they should be. It's in there for twelve thousand seven hundred forty three dollars and eighty six cents. Do you have it on a different screen, Jim? Because I'm in the general two point oh. Oh, geez. Screen. Okay, I I probably clicked the wrong tab. I'm sorry. There it is. Public safety dispatching. You have it right there. Yep. That's that's why. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't complete the the general like 1.9, 1.8, 1.7 because it, it it really doesn't do us any favors yeah. to go to go right. down in rate. Um, but yeah, that's that was that. We allocated that separately. In in the past, these two were always aggregated together. Exactly. And I think it really does us a little bit of a disservice from a historical data standpoint. It's real difficult to look back and figure out how much you spent on police service versus how much was like 911 dispatching and other things. Um, so we, uh, we go is, this, is this particular file in the shared drive? It is. Okay. Yes. So I it, go to the office and print it out, and this way I could update it in QuickBooks and get that taken care of. That, and then Dan and I can work on the chart of accounts as well. Correct. It's, uh, it's in two places on the Google Drive. There's uh, two identical copies. One is in the public directory, which is a read-only copy for the, the public to, to review. And then there's a, a full uh, read-write copy in the supervisor's directory. This is wonderful. I, I love how you broke it down, and, and I love how you made everything look pretty compared to what I sent you originally. Well, I, I thank you for doing what I would call the, the heavy lifting of getting all the, the numbers out of QuickBooks and to me. Yeah. The rest of it is is me just poking at it until it works. Um, with that said, I think the general fund is in good shape. We have everything covered from snow snow removal to uh, we, we're allocating beyond what we have in the state fund, which will be the, the next fund I touch in a second. Uh, we have $90,000 for uh, additional road work as well as uh, another $10,000 just specifically for wages around doing the road work. So it's an additional hundred thousand dollars worth of, of road work capacity that we can do next year. Okay, going over to the state fund. Uh, the state fund is uh, an interesting beast in the sense that we get funding, uh, grants, turnbacks, things like that, but it has to be used in very specific ways. You can buy certain types of equipment with it as long as it's being used with the road. You can obviously do road work and repairs. Uh, they're subject to like bid requirements and like prevailing wage and things like that. There's a lot of stipulations that go along with that. Um, and uh, we actually have not used much or any of that over the past two years for one reason or another. So we have a, a pretty healthy balance in that account uh, as well as there's a, a pretty substantial fund in the, the essentially the savings account equivalent of the, the road fund. So we had originally talked about a little bit of a higher amount here for repairs and maintenance. If we do $350,000 in estimated road work and $15,000 in snow and ice removal costs, which is uh, for the record, a fairly generous estimation of if we had a, a lot of substantial snowstorms and had to have the plow trucks out frequently, 
it's going to be very difficult to hit 15,000, but you, you plan for the worst, that way you're prepared. Um, at that rate, we would undercut the account in terms of revenue. This is worth noting that it is, we're looking at a single year worth of revenue by about $220,000. It would not, however, deplete the fund. We would be down to about 40,000 in that fund, which is, I don't want to say a more normal level, but it's, it's generally the kind of balance that you'd have after you do an annual substantial road work. We get, oh geez, probably about $150,000, give or take a little bit annually. In yeah, I should probably zoom in again. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that we're a little high in revenue this year from a liquid fuels allocation. And I think that was largely just a delay in delivery on a check um, from the year prior. But our, our normal estimate is about 100,000 from liquid fuels allocation. And our turn back is a, a, a predefined amount. And that's $52,320. Uh, we actually have that figure it's the same because it's based on the length of mileage for, for the, the roads that we have in the township. And the liquid fuel allocation is a little on the variable side, but we did receive an estimate of that $90,841.85 uh, earlier this year. So those two numbers are, are relatively firm in the sense of, of understanding what we're gonna have come in as revenue, other than just simple interest on the, the checking and savings accounts, which based on the, the high balances that we have in those is actually a pretty respectable amount. So the, the follow-up question that I have for you guys, uh, Jim and Irene, is based on the fact that we have, I think, somewhere to the tune of about $360,000 in the, the, the money market, the savings account for the road fund, do we potentially want to shift like $60,000 or something uh, out of the savings account into the checking account and increase this to like a $400,000? I have no problems with that. Jim, what are your thoughts? Because we'd be essentially at that point looking at essentially a half million dollars worth of road work next year. I have no problem with that. Okay, so I will, I will make the change. I will make sure that it's updated on the Google Drive. And uh, for anybody that looks at this, don't have a heart attack that the, the ending balance is negative. Uh, it does not reflect the fact that we would be shifting $50,000 from the, the, the savings fund into the checkings fund, checking account. And just to, to clarify, we had some conversation, uh, Andy and I, prior to the meeting. Uh, there is, and Andy, keep me honest on record here, there is nothing that we know of that prohibits us from shifting uh, road fund money from the checking or from the savings to the checking as long as it's used in the uh, acceptable and approved capacities of what that road fund is allowed. That is 100% accurate. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Otherwise, I think this is ready to go. I've looked it over. Uh, Irene, Jim, you had looked it over at the workshop. I had Dan also look it over. Um, we seem to be in a good spot and it's, I think, ready to be accepted and advertised. It looks awesome, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, so uh, we're gonna need to make a motion around that. I'll make a motion to advertise the proposed budget for 2021 for Marion Township. Second that. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. I just have one question for you, Peter. Yes. Um, when you're representing the millage, is that that line that you have, the 2.0, 1.9, is that going to be in there as well, or is that something you're going to uh, remove? I can include it. Because okay. that, that lists the um, the millage, the, the purposes of having it in that Excel sheet was, was twofold. One, so that it's clearly stated, and two, when we were going through our initial review of this, that's uh, there were a number of formula that hinged on that, so that if we change that to 1.9, it would change the revenue on the appropriate tab so that you could see, okay, if we do 1.9, we're, we're short $10,000. If we do 1.8, we're short $20,000, that, that sort of thing. So... When we do the, the printout copy to be to advertised or uh, in the, the purposes of uh, when I update the one that's on the, the Google Drive, I'll, I'll break all of the formula so that they're all firm values. No, thank you. Okay. Um, that concludes any of the agenda items that we have for this evening. Um, in terms of comments, the only thing that I have is the police report. 
which there's really not much to to discuss on the police report. It looks like a nice quiet month. There were a, a couple of uh, EMS fire advisories, but otherwise there were no parking tickets. There were only two traffic accidents. Excuse me. Uh, no traffic warnings. No traffic citations. No traffic stops. Um, it seems like October was a good month for for just general behavior in Marion Township. Um, so the only other thing that I want to bring up in terms of comments is that uh, that funding program that Jim McCarthy pointed out. I don't know if you guys have gotten a chance to read over the email, but there is a, a program that we could start making applications to that does a 50% matching. Um, so if I think he had another municipality, I can't remember which one it was as an example, that they're pursuing a $4 million project and they're essentially going to be tentatively getting $2 million worth of funding for it. So it's for things specifically around like the township building, either the repair or construction of municipal buildings, spaces and things like that. Um, Jim, I know you've expressed an interest in, in building a new township building somewhere, but uh, logistically that's, it's very difficult. And um, it, it's a good idea on the surface, but I think it may be more challenging than rehabbing the existing structure that we have especially if we can essentially get uh, a, a, a match on funding to do it. So I guess our, our next steps on this uh, would be, let's outline what we want to try to achieve on the building. The, the, big, the big ones for me are new windows. Um, I'd also like to, to, to float the idea around of building a pole barn garage for the trucks behind the salt shed and getting the, the trucks out of the garage into an actual dedicated space for that rather than something that was, was repurposed. Uh, and then potentially rehabbing that space into office space and shifting Sue over to that side of the building. Um, additionally, while we're, we're chasing things, uh, wild pipe dreams here, especially when we can get uh, funding from it, and we can look and see if there's other things for grants around like ADA compliance and things like that, but trying to get an elevator in the building. Um, all of these things are, are stuff that we would not be able to afford on our own, but if we can start offsetting 50% or better, they start be, to become real possibilities. Yes. So um, start looking around. I'll start reading through that program. I uh, implore the both of you to do likewise. Um, but at some point, I'd imagine that uh, for the purposes of applying for a lot of these grants, we're going to have to have some sort of cost figure or estimate. So that's going to mean calling places like Mike's remodeling about the windows. We need to, an estimate for doing all the remaining windows on the building. Um, uh, Troy Brubaker or other roofing companies for, hey, we want to redo the soffits or we want to do uh, the elevator calling some companies to, to come out and give us an estimate on, okay, if we wanted to, to install this from the first floor to the second floor, what, what are we looking at? Um, Obviously, like I said, not something we're going to be able to do on our own. We can't organically finance that, and I don't think we should be taking out loans because of just the, the, the recurring nature of having to pay back loans. But if we can get a lot of it essentially paid for as a, a matching or better, then I think we'd be silly not to. Give me a list of stuff. People start, and I'll start calling and getting numbers. Okay, we'll start assembling that list. But uh, if we can hit the ground running on that, I think that would be ideal. And I think we have... Uh, a good situation in the sense that it's kind of like the playground. Anybody that comes out and looks at it, like uh, the the DCED and stuff like that, they go, "Yeah, you really could use this." So that that paints a good picture for us. Uh, it's not it's not great that it got left into the, to get to the state that it's in, but it certainly does help our argument for when we're we're asking for for help. Um, so we'll uh, we'll get some some ideas and, and stuff together, and uh, we'll start trying to make some some real sizable uh, enhancements and improvements in 2021. That's, uh, that's all my comments. Uh, Irene, do you have any comments? Thank you to everyone who was able to help me out making all those numbers look nice and presentable. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, Jim, do you have any comments? Just happy Thanksgiving to everyone and all the residents of Marion Township. Yes, absolutely. It's been a rough year, but there's there's a lot to be thankful for as well. Yeah, 2020 has been a pretty rough decade. <laughs> <laughs> um, but absolutely, I echo the the happy Thanksgiving to everybody, and just uh, once again, I'll echo the uh, stay safe. Uh, I hope you get to spend time with your loved ones, everyone, but uh, be sure to be safe and and 
don't uh, don't lose sight of the long term safety to for something that's that's short term uh, in terms of enjoyment. Um, Andy, do you have any comments? I I don't have anything additional. Just happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Lord knows it's going to be different, but uh, <laughs> hope everybody enjoys it um, in in a different way. Stay Absolutely. safe. Okay. Craig, do you have any comments from an engineering space? The only thing I have is Jim <clears throat> asked me to uh, <clears throat> find out if what the situation is with uh, the certification for the dirt and gravel road um, uh, applications. We're going to have to be resubmitting those in 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 January, um, and we need someone that's certified to do the signing. You know, there was Peter. Uh, Peter. Um, uh, it was uh, Peter Wallace, Wallace Franklin yeah. Troutman. Actually, Franklin's expired. Yeah. Um, so, as a, a quick update to you, Craig, um, I'm going to try and go. I'm not sure if my work schedule is going to permit it, but I've also asked Irene and Jim if the, if able to attend. Okay. Uh, and I'm also putting a line out to the road crew for any of them that would be interested. We would. Okay. Uh, put forward the, whatever the funding is needed to get them there and back again to get that certification. The goal being to have as many people as possible in the township that have that, that would be able to sign for those grants. Sure. Okay. We do have a backup plan in place in case that f falls through because we don't know when or where or if all that training is going to be available mm -hmm. before we need it. Yes. There, we do have kind of a backup plan in our back pocket. So. Okay. Is that the one that we had talked about before with signing on, like somebody from Tulpa Hawken? Yeah. Or the road crew? Yeah. 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 And I think we've had good traction and good luck with them in the past. And I think they've actually already kind of tentatively agreed to that, that we'd sign somebody okay, on essentially in name only, and they would be able to endorse stuff. They'd be, a, they'd be on the road crew, but not really on the road crew. Right. Um, right. And there's a couple of options for that. We have a couple of municipalities that would – we will only do that. That's fantastic. If it's not already been said, please extend our, our thanks and gratitude for the, the willingness to help us out. Will do. But and other than that, all I have to do is say uh, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for the opportunity to sit in on the meeting tonight. It's always nice having you, Craig. Okay, Sue, do you have any comments? Nothing, just happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Okay. In that case, uh, I will make a motion to adjourn the meeting. The time is now 8.44 p.m. Second that. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. All right. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Happy Thanksgiving. Good night. Bye. Good night.